Okay, so our first speaker today is Dermid O'Connell. Uh, he is the Vice President of Business Development at Tesla Motors. And here he is. <laughs> It's a great intro because it lets me talk about myself, which I love to do. Um, <laughs> first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers, Doug and, and the team, uh, the forum moderators who were just acknowledged here, and all of you. Uh, you know, when uh, we started this whole thing, uh, and uh, I'm not going to say that I was one of the founders, I wasn't, that was well litigated some, some time ago. <laughs> um, but when we all started uh, many years ago now, uh, we couldn't have imagined, uh, well, some of us could have imagined, and I'm sure Elon did, but uh, many of us couldn't imagine this kind of setting or the kind of response that we get and I'm privileged to receive uh, all around the world. Um, spent a lot of time in Europe and in China in the past year and a half, and uh, this is a worldwide movement, and it's, uh, uh, it's really uh, gratifying to see the kind of support that, uh, that, we, that we have and, and that continues to grow. Um, this is, a, uh, this is a, a marker day for me. Uh, it was this day eight years ago that I joined the company. Um, it was the day that we launched the uh, Tesla Roadster in Santa Monica. And there's a guy sitting in the audience. I'm going to ask him to stand up uh, because I love to embarrass him. Dorian West, who's actually one of the engineering geniuses who uh, conceived of the energy storage system and got that first car on the road. Um, because it was eight years ago and because uh, I was there at the launch um, responsible for the follow-up, uh, I think I might have actually taken the first uh, phone call from Danny Sachs. Uh, I don't know where you are, Danny, but uh, love to reconnect. Um, it was a time when we were getting a lot of uh, incoming calls from all over the world, people who were interested, uh, who had been diehard EV enthusiasts, uh, some who had just heard of us, and we were really trying to sort out what was real and, and what wasn't, and it was hard to do. Um, and, uh, and Danny presented himself as a high school student, um, but so passionate that uh, within a couple of weeks, I'm trying to remember the timeline, uh, he showed up at, uh, at Tesla, and um, you know, notwithstanding uh, his, uh, his age and, uh, and experience, um, we, we, I, I, hope, and I hope we supported him in the, in the manner that uh, that he deserved, um, but I want to th thank him for starting this whole thing um, and, uh, and, and acknowledge that. Um, what I thought I'd do today, I'm going to give you a, a brief overview. I'm not going to PowerPoint you to death, um, but give you a brief update on the company. Uh, maybe I'll start a little bit with how I got to the company because I think that, that says something about uh, mission, uh, a sense of mission that we all share. Um, so then I'll give you a little bit of an overview of the company with a couple PowerPoint slides, and then I thought maybe I'd talk about some of the projects that I've been involved in uh, some of which uh, I'm well known for in the press, uh, some others not, uh, and then open it up to some questions. So if that's okay with you guys, um, I'm going to just start that way. This, yeah, this is, a, I, I, I was going to say, I used to have a lot of freedom to, to say whatever I wanted to say about the company and our, pro and our plans, but now I have to open every presentation with a forward-looking statement. Um, uh, <laughs> so I, I hope you caught it. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to see any of you in court, um, but uh, here's another amazing thing. Um, you know, when Dory and I started, well, actually, Dory started earlier than I did, so he was in, a, in, a original, in, a, in an even smaller location, but there were 50 of us the day I joined in a small building in San Carlos. Um, we now have worldwide operations. We have uh, the, the headquarters in R&D was impressive in and of itself, and then if, for some of you have seen the plant over in Fremont, I think it's one of the biggest car plants in the world. Uh, five million square feet under roof, and um, uh, I bore a lot of the uh, pain and sweat of acquiring that thing, so I, I feel very personally about that. It's, it's certainly the biggest real estate acquisition I'll make in my life. Uh, but we've got a beautiful design center, which some of you will have uh, um, visited for, uh, for free, uh, free charging. Uh, I, I was down there the other day, and I met someone who lives in Manhattan Beach and works in downtown LA. He doesn't charge at home. He just charges along the way at the, so, uh, whatever. Um, that's good. <laughs> Um, hey, that's the proposition, right? Free forever. Um, and then we've got an operation in Tilburg, uh, which is, um, uh, in industry terms, I would call it uh, uh, something on the order between a SKD and a CKD, where we do final assembly of roads of, uh, of Model S in, uh, in Europe. But uh, 
that kind of breadth I couldn't have imagined a long time ago. Um, some of these slides are going to get cut off a little bit. I think that says 375 million miles driven, which is a key point. I, I can't remember how many locations we got here. I mean, we can change this in a little bit. But basically, 70, the, the point is, I mean, as many stores as we have, that's all key. And when I'm out in the public arena, um, I, I'd certainly focus on that. But it's the service centers that are really important because we're trying to build a long-term relationship with, uh, with you guys. Make sure you have an excellent experience. And, and in that regard, I'm sure that a lot of you have, uh, well, I hope that a lot of you don't have service issues with your cars. But if you have questions, um, if you have uh, suggestions for improvement um, following, uh, you know, following this setting and so forth, feel free to send me an email and I'll make sure those get directed to the right place. It's just my first name at teslamotors.com. So please send those to me. Um, the supercharger network, super excited about. We started this about a year and a half ago. Really. Um, I, could, I could say, you know, we conceived of the world and what an important thing and decisive element supercharger would be, but frankly, I don't think we did. We were, we were shocked by the reception, but we're trying to build on that uh, and we're expanding that supercharger network uh, at a rapid pace. Um, uh, we've, you've seen the, the map of the U.S., I'm sure. Uh, I had the opportunity to drive from Amsterdam uh, to San Anton and then down to uh, Geneva. Uh, over the Christmas holiday, and that was just, that was amazing, and that, that network went up so quickly. Uh, so we're building Europe, and, and we were just in China where we launched uh, two supercharger sites, and we're going to be going fast forward there as well. Um, the car continues to improve. Again, sorry this got cut off. Uh, some of you, especially the aficionados, know that we're rolling out some of these offerings. Uh, some of the neat things, I mean, this is the climate package here with uh, heated rear seats, power folding mirrors. Um, constant upgrades to the uh, drivetrain through firmware and software. Parking sensors, that's key. It's a bit hippie in the back. Um, so we like to have that. Um, what else have we got there? Oh, seating. Yeah, seating. That's, that's a big one. I, um, even I would testify to the fact that I think we can do better with the seating and we're going to. Uh, we continue to be, again, our bar is off to the left, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's off the exactly. I love that. It's off the charts. Um, we <laughs> we uh, we continue to uh, we continue to really perform well against uh, against industry against the segment peers. And really, that's the point. I mean, the conception of the Model S, um, as it will be with the uh, with the now designated Model Three, uh, is that it's a great car first and foremost. That it competes pound for pound. Uh, with every car in its in its price and and f and product segment, um, and so a statistic like this is super meaningful um, because it means that it's a great car primarily uh, and an EV uh, almost secondarily. Um, not that that isn't key to what we're doing, but but packaging this thing up, productizing this thing in a way that's compelling for uh, the mass market is really what's going to propel this technology into the mainstream. So this is really important. It's also a cross that I bear. Um, one of my responsibilities is sort of holding the line on our, on our retail model. Um, when we have this kind of segment, or this kind of success against the Mercedes, the BMW, and the other dealers in the neighborhood, uh, that generates a little bit of, uh, uh, of uh, a challenge for me. Uh, we continue to get, uh, get uh, great um, uh, reports out of consumer reports. Um, that's something we track uh, very seriously and, um, uh, and continue to stay focused on. I, we, we've got a great track record there. I, I almost nervously pick up every consumer reports about the next Model S report, hoping, that, uh, hoping we're continuing our, our performance there. But so far, so good. Um, so some of the things that are happening, uh, some of which I've been involved with recently uh, that are interesting, you know, we're, as I said, we're growing the stores, service centers, impressive uh, um, uh, growth targets uh, in both. Uh, China, really, really interesting. Um, uh, spent uh, the better part of the last year and a half back and forth to China, uh, setting up some of the infrastructure, hiring some of the folks there with others, um, uh, dealing with uh, an issue that uh, has gotten into the headlines recently, our, our trademark, the trademark issue, um, sorting that all out. Um, but uh, then had the opportunity to go over with Elon uh, a couple, it's now April, right? Um, and, uh, and launch over there in Beijing and in Shanghai. And that was just amazing. The reception that we got was extraordinary. I think the timing in China, um, and if I'll, I'll spend a moment on it, something that happened in China um, the, in the last five year plan, which they're about three years into, uh, the, uh, the policymakers had prescribed that 
uh, a certain amount, number of new energy vehicles, uh, their parlance for EVs, uh, would need to, need to be on the road by the end of the five-year plan. Well, fast forward three years into the plan and not much progress had been made, and you've got a new leadership uh, who is focused on a couple of strategic issues um, related to stability, re related to lifestyle, and pollution and is one of those. And so um, he has basically doubled down on the targets in the last five-year plan, announced a very aggressive program for supporting new energy vehicles, and we show up basically at that same moment. Our positioning there is very much the way uh, I've, uh, we have tried to position ourselves in general, um, which is that, you know, uh, and this is particularly important in, in the Chinese market, which is a home brand market for which the government is trying to develop home industries um, uh, under, you know, an industrial substitution um, uh, um, a model, which is completely understandable. They would like to, pr they would prefer to see their home brands and their home technology flourish. Uh, so in that context, but consistent with our mission, we're saying, hey, look, um, we're here uh, as the vanguard of the revolution. We want to, if our success will be measured not just by our own ability to sell cars, we have to do that, but, uh, but by all of the imitation and competition that we inspire. And, and I think that message is getting some traction, um, notwithstanding the sort of mercantile nature of that uh, market and the intense competition in that market, there's a, there's a, a sort of a philosophy of, uh, of, um, of harmony and uh, so forth that underlies a, s a lot of the social uh, context there and within which our proposition sort of fits nicely. And I think Elon's statement about, um, you know, consistent pricing uh, around the world was very well received. You know, we aren't the car company that showed up to see how much profit they could scrape off the table in the first 24 to 36 months of, of operation, which is what all of our peer competitors did and still do. So, um, you know, to the extent that we've been able to get that message out there, it's, it's made, it's, I hope that, I don't want to say that it has made because I don't have statistics to testify to it, but I hope that it's making us look like more of a, of a home product, of a product that's coming to help build uh, the, the, to bring something positive to, to Chinese society uh, as opposed to simply, uh, you know, uh, making a buck. Um, in other markets, you know, we've got a right-hand drive uh, product. Uh, Elon was in the UK recently launching that product there. Uh, I have high hopes uh, for that product. I've got my sister in that market reporting to me how many cars she sees in her neighborhood. There's an interesting phenomenon in, in, uh, in London, um, in some of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the world, uh, people park on the street. The, the housing is, is the housing stock is old. They don't have uh, garages uh, uh, as we do sometimes, even in our cities. I mean, it's similar to New York, but different. Even in that, you don't even have large apartment buildings with underground parking. So that's a challenge, and we're meeting that challenge by modifying our supercharger network to a degree uh, in order to to create more of an urban uh, offering as well uh, to take care of that, uh, that problem. Because, you know, in, in any given neighborhood, you see Aston Martin, Aston Martin, Jaguar, Mercedes right on the curb. And, and our cars have to sit there as well. And, and there is a movement to get uh, curbside charging in certain boroughs in London. Um, but uh, understanding that that takes time and requires breaking up pavement, we're setting up uh, urban supercharging. And we're doing this in China as well because you have a, a high density living situation. Um, many of uh, our target customers have villas, but they live by week in, in, the, in the cities or they live full time in the cities in, in luxury high rises. So we need to solve the problem there as well, but we're already working on it. Hong Kong, similar issues, uh, but, uh, but a tremendous uptake in, in Hong Kong. Uh, Japan, very much of a home brand market, but, uh, but we're hoping uh, for some success there. And, and Australia uh, with a real serious movement around green sensibilities. One of the big projects internally at Tesla right now is, um, is uh, uh, resetting uh, some of our manufacturing facilities basically to accommodate higher volume. Uh, the most important element is this new line. If, uh, let me direct your attention. For those of you who have seen the plant, you know that on the south end, which is on the left side of the screen, uh, right as you look at it, uh, that's where we concentrated final assembly. But uh, that was a sort of, there's a sort of serpentine system there. It, we wanted to be compressed. We wanted to have um, uh, sort of, uh, um, we wanted to be as efficient as we could with space and with operations in the, in the initial stages, but we now need to spread it out into what would be more of a typical assembly line, which is what you see at the bottom of the chart. Um, and that's going to help us scale S, help us introduce X, and that's one of the big projects going on this summer. We're expanding other operations 
as well up on the second floor, which is an area that we don't often show to the public, uh, we are uh, uh, expanding our drivetrain uh, uh, operations in, as well. And, and, and so much of this is being done uh, with reference to, uh, uh, to the, the launch of the Model X, which we're super excited about. Um, my, uh, my wife insisted uh, a couple years ago that we get a, um, uh, a Toyota Sienna uh, minivan. Um, this was before we had even had the S on the road, and uh, I fought for a while on that one. I was like, look, the X is coming, the X is coming. Um, <laughs> soon, soon. Well, I think we, may, I think we actually, uh, we, we, we tipped a little bit more on timing right now, but I've got an eight-year-old daughter who hates the Sienna, the, the minivan, as much as I do. And, um, and she, you know, every single day, it's, Dad, can I see the X? Dad, where's the X? So I am personally, uh, corporately and personally, very much vested uh, in getting this thing going. So, uh, and, uh, and uh, here we are. Um, uh, before I get to questions, um, let me, I, I sort of changed uh, um, subjects a little bit, but it's uh, by talking a little bit about my background, I can get into some of the things that I'm doing. I joined Tesla um, sort of out of the clear blue sky. After following, I, I'd been in Silicon Valley, I'd been uh, in and out of, I'd, I'd uh, done startups, I'd done consulting in the Valley for some time. I came out in 1995, but uh, I had a background, an academic background in national security from, from way back. I was actually a Soviet expert, but I was a Soviet expert when they were shutting down the Soviet Union, so I, uh, <laughs> at the very least I had a brand problem, so I parked, <laughs> I parked my, uh, my doctoral studies, uh, I'm one of those ABD guys, probably always will be, but, um, and I went into the commercial, commercial world. Uh, uh, fast forward to, you know, and I was doing, I just exited, uh, we just sold a startup in, in, uh, uh, in early 2000, um, happily uh, before the, the, the bubble burst uh, on the first tech, on the first uh, internet bubble. But, um, watched the uh, planes hit the buildings in New York and uh, said to myself, look, if I'm ever gonna go do something in public service, this would be a good time to do it through a, you know, through for fortunate circumstance and naivete and doggedness, I ended up with a very interesting job in Washington for over the course of three years where I got really involved in national security work, principally um, in, the, uh, in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, was, um, had a front row seat for the worst of the IED campaign in Iraq, and one of my unfortunate tasks every morning was um, uh, reporting out from our op center um, who, uh, who, had, uh, who had died and, and how they died and where they're from because the, the folks I was working for were, uh, they were diplomats, but they were former military leaders, and for them it was very personal. And I started thinking about what I wanted to do with the rest of my career, uh, having decided that uh, I was not going to stay in Washington, and I wasn't really down with the strategy. Uh, so I started thinking about what had us in, uh, what had us overextended, overinvested in certain parts of the world. Um, oil, uh, if you talk to any, any, anyone in national security, and, and certainly in military leadership, they focus on oil. Um, so I started focusing on oil, I started studying oil. Uh, which led me inexorably to a study of the automotive industry because that's where most oil is used in our economy. <clears throat> and uh, the thesis was that I could find a place where I could uh, apply leverage to uh, an other than oil strategy for transportation. But my conclusions about the industry, which sadly have been validated by eight years of experience up close and personal, is that within the industry there's very little leverage. Uh, there are very few incentives for uh, the incumbents to to innovate in any meaningful way and certainly around drivetrain technology. You know, there, there's innovation in increments on the margin. Uh, sometimes it's in the drivetrain technology, a, you know, a turbocharger here um, or a, uh, an eight-speed gearbox there, uh, but very often it's in, you know, the quality of the stitching in the interior and it's, 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 it's innovation on the margin. I came back to Silicon Valley hoping to find uh, something, you know, some disruptive uh, technology or company and it was you know through sheer luck and circumstance that I found Tesla and, and Dorian and, and the crew uh, having started this project and it just made so much sense to me I mean a couple elements one uh, that stood out one was that you know they were using battery technology which was already available and, and in production at scale so you know the most expensive complicated uh, cost intensive 
component of the of the of the new generation drivetrain was right there and uh, and then the other piece that really made sense to me was you know you start this thing with uh, low volume a high price you move from you move through mid volume mid price some of you might argue that the mid model s is mid volume mid or mid price but <laughs> You'd be surprised what the ASP is in the industry these days. Um, and then ultimately get to that mass market vehicle, which is the North Star for all of us. Um, and uh, just really, really fortunate to find these guys. But I brought to the company no engineering expertise. I might have been one of the first non-engineers to join the company. And uh, that's not necessarily a badge of honor at Tesla Motors. <laughs> um, I, I had a background in marketing and uh, a recent experience in government. And so that's led me into a number of uh, sort of interesting strategic uh, projects, most of which uh, I had no experience in before I got involved or before Elon said, can you go, you know, can, on a good day, would you please go look at this or um, can, you please, or can you please fix this thing? <laughs> so um, I've joked that sometimes I, I feel like I'm the vice president for um, big, uh, big problems and big opportunities, but that's, uh, that's led me into some interesting areas. Um, you know, these days, uh, I, I've always been on the front line of our relationships with OEMs, um, with other automakers, whether that's our commercial projects, such as we've done with Toyota and Mercedes, um, or um, the steady state relationships that we have with some of them, uh, which some of which are well covered, uh, the credit business, I'm responsible for that, but uh, sort of other things on the margins, um, you know, the, the speculation that, uh, that uh, the most recent speculation that uh, BMW and Nissan are going to, you know, adopt the supercharging uh, standards and so forth as a result of Elon's announcement about trademarks. Um, you know, there's some substance to that, some not, but that those those issues hit my desk. Um, the other one for which uh, I'm probably too well covered in the media is the dealer issue, um, and uh, <laughs> so actually that's a hell of a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I gotta say, so. Um, uh, I'm, you probably figured out I'm not, I'm, I'm not native Californian. I, oh, I came out here like looking for that kind of cool, confident uh, aspect uh, that all the Californians that I, uh, that I met when I grew up back east had. Um, but I, I, I got to say, I haven't been able to adopt it. So sometimes I show my colors. Uh, I grew up in Boston. I'm fifth generation Irish. And, and you really don't have to you know, do much to get me into an argument. Um, <laughs> So, and that's good, because uh, this dealer issue is, uh, is pretty down and dirty. Um, it started uh, in late 2012. I mean, I, I had always anticipated that as we opened stores, as we became more successful, and in view of our analysis of the uh, retail marketplace, and in particular, all of the regulations that had grown up around uh, auto retailing, that at some, some point we were going to start to get into into some sort of dust up with uh, with dealers or dealer associations or maybe even the large automakers and um, you know we had an early taste of this about four or five years ago where uh, the New York dealers or a dealer in New York sued uh, the attorney general there um, uh, for issuing a license to us but the attorney general at that time in New York defended the case and we went on with business but then in late 2012 a very energetic leader of the uh, Massachusetts Auto Dealers Association um, decided to challenge our license uh, licensing process in Massachusetts. I mean, how perfect is that, right? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, first of all, the symbolic nature. I mean, Lexington and Concord. You know, this is the stuff that we grew up with. The first shot is fired in Massachusetts, and I gotta say, when when so we went back. The first my first touch with the dealer out there. Um, he's a very energetic guy named Bob Okanowski. Um, we were in the Dedham Superior Court. Uh, I actually grew up in the county of Dedham outside uh, Massachusetts, and I've been to that Superior Court before. I won't tell you why, but um, <laughs> but uh, uh, he sort of boldly came up to me when it was I had my Tesla pin on, and, and uh, there weren't many people in the court. It was the judge, our lawyers, their lawyers a couple of dealers who were bringing the suit, um, uh, Bob uh, and, and myself, and I had a pin on, and he comes up to me and, and he hands me his card in a kind of bold way and says, well, when you guys, uh, Bob Okanowski, 
when you guys uh, uh, take on dealers, uh, here's a, or when you guys want to have a dealership, why don't you give me a call? And I'm not going to do it right now because it doesn't, it, it will sound like parody, but I've, I've washed the Boston accent out of my system because it's not exactly a success factor anywhere else in, in the world. <laughs> but um, but when, uh, when I said to Bob, um, Bob, it's, uh, it's very nice to meet you. Uh, I want to tell you that uh, we, we're going to come here and we're going to sell our cars. And, uh, and we want to do so in, a, in, the, in the most, uh, in the friendliest way possible. But if you want to, if, if you're going to turn this into a fight, we're going to meet you. Um, something like that. And, and, uh, and that was sort of game on from there. And actually, um, Massachusetts is an interesting one. It's been this stubborn thing that's gone on and on. We're anticipating a... Uh, a ruling out of the superior court, out of the Supreme Court in Massachusetts, um, uh, uh, which we think will come out in our direction. It's only about standing, but in the meantime, we have a licensed operation there. And beyond the Massachusetts story, for the past year and a half, uh, during the legislative sessions, we've been, uh, and it's been well covered, uh, dealing with uh, mostly attacks on our model by the dealers. And those attacks have sometimes come in court, but mostly come through legislative process. And the legislative arena is where the dealers have a lot of sway uh, because of you know, the history of the dealer system, because of um, the political activism of the dealers. I say activism, you can, that's a euphemism, right? Okay. Um, but uh, you know, this, is, this is their territory. And, and uh, you know, I think we've all either been on Little League teams or had kids on Little League teams or or it been at various other community events that have been sponsored by X Chevrolet or, or Y Ford. And, and so that's just, it, these folks are in the community and, and they're, you know, they're, they're not bad folks. They're just building their own businesses just as we're building our businesses, but they're the beneficiaries of going on 80 years of uh, increasing regulation, or I'm sorry, increasing protectionist regulation uh, coming out of the state courts. And so that makes it difficult for us. Um, but we've learned a lot of things, and some of you in the audience have been really helpful with this. We've learned a lot along the way, and that is one of the things that we know is that bringing attention to these issues, they can, they can sneak up on you because, I, I don't know how many of you remember Schoolhouse Rock, but um, I sure learned a lot about, if I didn't learn civics growing up, I sure know civics now. Um, and I gotta say, it's, you know, it's, it hasn't exactly been heartening uh, to, been, to be fighting these things in, um, in state capitals. And I say that as a statement about uh, actually the democratic process, sadly. Um, we've got a fantastic system, but there's too much money in it. Um, and that becomes more and more pronounced uh, the lower you go um, in terms of, you know, or the more local you become. Um, and, it's, it, and it's a disturbing, disturbing phenomenon. We've just, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't play with money even if we wanted to, and I'm not sure it's the right way to go. I mean, we're, we're, we operate on principle, um, and one of the first things we do in every market is try and bring, shine a spotlight on this. I mean, I've, as I've said publicly, you know, we work best in the light of day, and, and they work best, you know, in the, in the dark of night. And the dark of night is, you know, the, 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 the fourth quarter of any year where, you know, bills are starting to be filed. Legislatures tend to meet in the January to July time frame. Most legislatures around the country are part-time, some are full-time, um, and some are biennial, like Texas and Arizona, Texas and uh, Nevada, um, come up a couple of the western states, which are small government folks. New Hampshire's a great one. They, they, uh, they meet for 30 days every year, and they pay the legislators something like 10 bucks to show up, and so <laughs> that's, that's, that's small government. Um, but... Um, you know, one of the first things we do is we, we activate uh, the local folks, the media, and, and really shine a light on this. And some of the folks in the audience here have been really fantastic about coming out and, and helping us. Um, we're gonna get more structured. You know, we've got two years of experience, two legislative experience, uh, seasons of experience with this. And uh, we're gonna get a little bit more structured about reaching out to folks like yourselves and asking you for advice and, and, um, and maybe to, to step up and, and um, uh, and share your voice, but, but key here is uh, intel. So I don't know how many of you have any interest in government, but keep an eye on what's going on in your legislature and, and let us know. You know, drop a dime to us if you hear about something that's, that's happening because uh, we have, uh, we have a, a, you know, an a growing uh, network of folks who let us know when something's coming up. 
But uh, we have had sneak attacks. There was a famous one in Missouri about four months ago where, you know, literally in the last three days of the legislature, they, they, you know, the dealers popped up with a bill attached to something else that was moving. You know, we caught wind of it and, uh, and, and blew it out and blew it up. Um, and that all worked out well. Um, you know, going into the next year, uh, we anticipate more of those, but, um, you know, we know how to deal with them now, and that's not a problem. Uh, and, you know, to a degree, we're, you know, we're, we're architecting solutions that we think work both for us and for, uh, for the dealers. In Pennsylvania, a really interesting case at the end of this session where the Dealers Association in Pennsylvania, <coughs> knowing that we could come to town and blow it up, um, said, you know, why don't, we, why don't we try and work something out that clarifies the situation for you guys, you know, gives us some sense of, of certainty. And so we, you know, actually together uh, architected something and went together to the legislature to clarify the situation that gives us five stores in Pennsylvania. So that's, that's, that's a good thing. Texas, Texas is a big one. Texas is the only place where I feel like, uh, not, to, not to be, not to use sports analogies, but um, I don't want to give you our one loss uh, a record. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but the one definitive loss we have was where we picked the battle in Texas. And we picked the battle we, because Texas is, is a huge market for car sales. Uh, at least 10% of cars are sold in Texas, and we believe that we could sell more than 10% uh, of our cars in Texas. But it has a definitive rule for all sorts of history, I don't need to get into, that if you're a dealer, if you're a manufacturer, there's, there is, you know, under no circumstances, uh, Elon likes to say it's a, like a Dr. Seuss rhyme, um, you know, you, you, you can't, there's no circumstance under which you can sell cars if you're a manufacturer. And so we need to deal with that. Um, and we started, we sort of first shot across the bow. The first time we went on the offense was last year, um, early in the legislative session there, but frankly too late to really make a difference um, in, a, in a meaningful way. But we started the conversation. We knew it was a two-year legislature. We knew it was going to be hard. We knew we had to start the conversation somewhere. And so we went down there, we made some noise, and we presented an argument, and we got a lot of traction. I mean, it's, it's kind of ironic that, you know, a state known for its economic liberalism, <coughs> uh, free market philosophies, is the place where it's the mo most draconian prohibitions against us pursuing free market principles and, and, uh, and engaging in, in, uh, in market-based competition. But there it is. Um, we've, we found a lot of friends, and uh, we're going to go after it again. Uh, starting in January in Texas, um, but uh, thanks. Um, I don't want to handicap our uh, our uh, chances of success. I mean, some legislators down there have said to us in the past, you know, generally, generally, Dearman. No, I won't try. I won't do the Texas accent. But uh, generally, it takes us about three sessions to do something that's this controversial. Um, uh, I told Elon that he's like, no. <laughs> No, 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 no. We're not going to take four years to do this. We're going to do it in, in two if we can. So, you know, we're going to present our arguments and we're going to see, um, see how it goes. Uh, let me see. So that's the dealer issue. Um, I'm going to wrap up here quickly and give you a couple. Uh, am I time checking? Okay. Um, let me just tell you one other thing that we're working on. That's the Gigafactory piece. Um, I don't want to get into details. I will show you the picture that generated all of the press and speculation. So. Uh, there's, uh, I don't know if it's, I, I haven't been following the forum that much, but people have been trying to, you know, pulling this up against Google Maps and trying to like, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I've been all over, uh, all over the country and all over the Southwest on this. Uh, we're super excited about this, um, and we're super excited about this. It's actually a good final slide because uh, it truly does open up the economics of, uh, of the Model 3. Um, uh, in that it allows us to, uh, uh, to take a lot of cost out of the, uh, the battery uh, system, the, the energy storage system. Um, it also allows us to, um, to get going in a meaningful way on, uh, on energy storage, which is something that I'm hugely excited about. Um, I think it's a real opportunity. You know, EVs uh, strategically work best when paired with uh, clean, uh, renewable uh, energy generation. And as, as anybody in this audience knows, 
while there's been tremendous penetration of renewables um, into the grid, uh, it's storage that will unlock uh, so much of that grid potential, as well unlocking the opportunities for distributed generation uh, and, uh, and storage. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll finish this with this, and I'll, and I'll actually take the slide back, right back off because I don't want you doing any speculation. Um, I, I, won't, I haven't got any more time for questions. I'd be happy to talk to you guys outside. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, so we have exactly 10 minutes for questions. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay, so, uh, so we have two, two microphones. Please line up at the microphones. Uh, very quick questions, very succinct answers. 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, go for it. He's Starting on this out. side here. Uh, okay. 400-mile um, battery pack for the Roadster. Comments? I've survived eight years at Tesla Motors, mostly by not getting out in front of Elon Musk. <laughs> Which is hard to do. Um, yeah, Elon's talked about that, and uh, I know that there's been, uh, there's, there's some planning going on internally. I just don't have any details that I can offer you right now. Okay, next question. Uh, navigation system, uh, we were promised some updates when we purchased the car to the onboard database, not the Google Maps, the one that's used for navigation, which sends you the wrong way to get here. And I'm wondering if you could uh, tell us what's happened. We haven't had any updates since 2012 to the onboard database, and the service center doesn't know anything. Yeah, and, and I apologize for that. This is in the category of things that I, I, I didn't come necessarily prepared to discuss that. But if you please send me an email personally. Well, yeah. if you could perhaps try to get the answer before the end of the conference and give it at the closing uh, tonight, that would be great. <laughs> yeah. I. I <laughs> Yeah, I, <laughs> because I'd love to do that, but personally, I, I'm on a plane at, at that time. But I will, I'll do my best to get you uh, a, good, a good update on that. So uh, I, you talked about how important the giga, uh, Gigafactory is and, and storage is, and I've talked to JB about it before, but I wanted to know where the plans are for V2G. So Tesla to grid, backups, and being able to use the car that way. Yeah, um, it's a good question, and actually I've been dealing with this publicly for about four years. I think V2G, I mean, it's got tremendous um, uh, potential, and, and we're engineered to take advantage of it. I've been concerned about conflating uh, the, the, the opportunities of V2G with the substantial challenge of EV penetration in the main, because there was a while there where it, it was seen as one of the, it was being positioned as one of the primary advantages of EVs, and there's so many things that have to happen uh, on the other side. Uh, of the cord uh, to make V2G possible. There's some great work being done by Willie Kempton and the folks out east. Um, but, I, you know, if you've talked to JB about his vision on this, uh, you've got the, the latest, which is to say that we're really anxious to, to, to you know, to, to see the possibilities, but um, it's not, I, I, I well, it, I, let's, let's just say that um, we're very cognizant of the opportunity. Um, we're prepared for it, um, but most of what has to happen is happening on the market side, um, and, uh, and so that's sort of where it lives right now. Uh, the criteria for the selection of the location for the Gigafactory and maybe the circle of people involved in that? Um, many and few. Um, <laughs> uh, many, uh, well, not many. I mean, a couple of key ones. Uh, you know, on the variable cost side, you care about uh, labor, energy, uh, and logistics, um, both inbound and outbound. Um, and, you know, you soften those constraints. You have targets and you soften those constraints based on uh, availability of land and co-investment and capital and those sorts of things. But um, those, are the, those are the top three, I would say, labor, uh, energy, and, log and logistics. Um, it's a relatively small uh, team, uh, but a, well, not a small team. It's a, it's a, it was a small core, but growing team, and it's represented by a couple of folks. Um, JB, of course, is a big part of it from the technology side. Uh, the, uh, the manufacturing uh, experts, key. Uh, and then um, until the deals are sort of consummated, uh, finance and my group are very involved, uh, and my group from the perspective on the deal side. Uh, we've, 
you know, we have government relations. I don't wear that title. I'm responsible for all the tasks. But uh, there's a lot of interface with local governments, with state governments as we do this. But um, so that's the short, the short term team is the, 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 uh, uh, the public policy and finance team. The long term is the technology and the manufacturing team. But it's a, those are the four domains and the teams are growing uh, in terms of headcount. Thanks for coming to be with us this morning. Um, if you'd like to make any news at all on the Model X, I'm sure it wouldn't leave this room, <laughs> except possibly to get posted on the internet. <laughs> you have the tools, I know. Um, no, I, uh, <laughs> again, I, I've survived, I've thrived by not getting ahead of uh, the boss. Um, you know, it, there's so much, uh, internal effort focused on getting this done and mostly getting it right. I mean, as Elon himself said, is if there's been any delay on this, it's been his, uh, it's been related to his um, very acute uh, but, and perfectionist uh, and, you know, and future oriented um, uh, product specification um, goals. So, uh, you know, we, I think I put a number up there. That's about as good as I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was a long discussion on, on the forum about the, the comparison of the Model S against the luxury segment. And you had this on your slide, uh, S-Class, A8, 7 Series. If you sit inside these cars, it's day and night. So the Model S is at least two classes below in perception of in internal luxury, which is a big part why you're selling so poorly in Germany and many Central European countries. Uh, can you say anything about upgrades to the interior? Yeah, look, um, I think that there are a couple dimensions. I, I, I acknowledge what you're saying um, up to a certain point, uh, not necessarily endorsing the judgment side of it, but uh, <laughs> um, certainly um, we can be doing more and different things on the interior side. Um, part of the design aesthetic of the car was, you know, was a, was a high-tech, clean, um, uh, not fussy interior. So short, yeah. um, so when that's your design vision, you're not going to have a cocoon, you're not gonna have the sort of experience that you might have in other cars, which are more focused on the like, cocooning uh, the driver, as I, as I like to say, and, and uh, you know, luxury, uh, luxury appointments uh, as a, that are more traditional. Uh, that having been said, I mean, we're listening to, to feedback. I think the first major, um, the first visible um, and uh, tactile, um, uh, or a major one, not the first, uh, tactile uh, and visual uh, improvement we'll make is in the offerings and the seats. Um, uh, I think that we're also, I, I don't know where we are in the rollout of a, um, of uh, something that um, works more as a console. Um, <laughs> yeah. But um, I, I'm not up to date on the product rollout on those sorts of things. But, but we're cognizant of the issue and we are, you know, we're focusing on, and just to your point, Germany is a key market, strategic market in Europe. Um, we've done okay there. We want to do better and that's got several dimensions. Um, uh, part of it is it's just going to be a hard market because it's a, it's a home market. We do enjoy a, a, a great engineering reputation there, uh, but it's mostly around the powertrain. Um, we have a growing reputation in other regards. Supercharging network is key, especially given the fashion in which people drive. Uh, their propensity to drive between major cities and their style of driving on the Autobahn um, <laughs> recommend um, a, a rather intensive deployment of super supercharger technology. So. I think the German market challenge is not wholly about the interior of the car, although that it must be acknowledged that we have to be doing, um, you know, at least as well as uh, as the competition on in those respects, and that's a focus that really is a major focus in the company. Okay, we have time for one more question, so this will be the last question. All right, so um, can you comment on the balance of? the opening of the patents with the entry into the Chinese market, the possibility of building up uh, you know, third party parts and mar marketplace there with the relatively closed ecosystem that you have today with regard to service and, and parts. Yeah, the, 
I would, I would first start by saying that from my perspective, the two are disconnected. The China entry and all of the potential IP issues um, that, are, that are well covered in the, in the broader industrial press as it relates to China are independent of the trademark issue. I mean, you, I've been saying this for a long time, um, others say it as well, which is truly if you want to judge anything we're doing, you got to go back to the mission. I mean, the mission of this company, which we all hold dear, I do for the reasons that I joined the company, Dorian for his, and everybody's got their own and their tweaks on each other's, whether it's environment, whether it's uh, um, uh, energy security, whether it's economic issues, whether it's a joy for the technology or joy for EVs, everything goes back to the mission. And the mission of this company is to catalyze a mass market towards sustainable transportation through electric vehicles. So the trademark issue was wholly done with that in mind, which is that we're just seeing that the other OEMs, and I see this personally, the other OEMs, there's only two OEMs that are making huge, make, have made a strategic decision to enter this market. We need more. Um, and so this is truly done in that context. That's the trademark issue. Um, so uh, as it relates, but it has implications. So if, if another OEM were to, were to adopt our technology, um, it would uh, open up the possibility that that technology was very much like our technology and could be serviced um, by us or, um, uh, or, or in the instance of supercharger, if we were ever to get to the point where we had a common connector and and other OEMs using our network by some business arrangement, you know, that would be another obvious opportunity. So I think it opens up a lot of possibilities, but the two are separate. The China strategy is the China strategy, it wholly focused on market development, selling cars, whatever it needs to do in order to get out there and get, um, get, the, get these cars on the road in China. The trademark issue, really sort of strategic as well, but, but in, a, in a different, uh, not unrelated, but, but different. Okay, let's all thank wait, uh, Doug. Wait, this. we've got one more thing. One more. We've got to answer her question. Right? Yeah, we, we yeah. have one more. We have a slight oh. tradition from last year. Uh, mm. Some of you may remember with Elon, Georgiana brought a small gift. Georgiana, I'll let you. Thank you so much. Just a second. I know this is Sonoma County wine, but I'm from New Mexico. So you can put that Gigafactory in New Mexico. <laughs> and, thank, and thank you so much, Tesla. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you all again. Thank you.